way back in history and in different countries throughout the world that this took place. For us, the Native Americans used gourds for almost everything. Even their children learned how to swim by taking two gourds, tying together with a piece of rawhide, and they could float in the water like our children use the blow up now, the Native Americans use the gourds. Uh, in the Old West times, the canteen gourd was extremely po uh, popular for holding water because a canteen gourd on the front of here, you can see it, and it is shaped, and that's how it got its name by, by this, the cowboys or the, the people out west, cut a hole in the top of that gourd, find some small rocks, put inside and shake that gourd, and then empty it and empty it and keep going until they could get the inside of the gourd as clean as possible. Because a gourd is extremely bitter. It has no nutritional value whatsoever. If you take your finger and wet it or a sponge or whatever on the inside or outside, especially the inside, and then take your finger and put it in your mouth, it'll take you a while to get rid of the bitterness. And I got to meet a gentleman from Africa several years ago, and uh, he came over to see the artwork. He was a curator from Africa, and he came over to see our artwork because they had gourds in Africa, and I asked him, I so said, what do you use them for? Well, they had the big kettle gourds. They made their beer in the kettle gourds. And he said, we would not like it because the beer was extremely bitter. And it would be because the beer was made in the inside of a gourd, which get, would give it a very bitter taste. Musical instruments runs from flutes to uh, like banjos. Uh, there, there's all types of, of uh, instruments that we've seen where uh, artists have taken a big kettle gourd and made the bottom of it like the shape, cut the top out flat, and insert a piece of wood, put an arm on it, st stretch the strings, cut their hole, and so forth. Some of the pieces are extremely expensive because there's the amount of time that's put in making musical instruments and gourds. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to stop me and ask because it won't interfere with my chain of thought. I'll miss half of what's on there. Yes, sir. No, but they will cross pollinate with each other. That has happened. They have a gourd that uh, about three years ago, and I bought several of them, and they're kind of a long round at the top, round at the bottom, and they're called potato gourd. A couple of years before that, I found some gourds that are shaped like a strawberry. They call them a strawberry gourd. So that's, the, that's, that's just the common name that they use. So those had cross-pollinated with something. And some ornamental gourds, you have to hand pollinate. And in order to hand pollinate, you have to find the male and the female. And so underneath the blossom, there would be a knot. That would be where the gourd would be produced. You take another blossom and rub it together and then tape that shut for overnight or 24 hours, depending on who you talk to, and then take the tape off and that pollinates because they will not get pollinated by insects or wind and so forth. Uh, growing gourds, I know very little about. All I do know is they take up a lot of space. And a, a one plant can just about fill this room if you've got a good season. And you, you, if you think I'm exaggerating, well, <laughs> you need to look around to different places. Your, uh, your, your big vendors that uh, grow gourds to sell to artists because that's what has evolved with the gourd. The gourd has become very, very popular throughout the United States and the world uh, creating artwork on. So they have huge trellises. Some of them are 13 feet tall. And they plant at the base of the trellis all the way around. 
and that will cover it and gourds will hang down the middle of the trellis and that keeps them up off of the ground which keeps them extremely clean. This is a fairly clean gourd here. This is a gourd that I'm working on, not complete, one that I've just got some wood burning done on it. But those gourds that hang from a trellis or the ones that are kept off of the ground are the cleanest. And so that's, those are more valuable to artists because if you are in competition at the shows that, that are throughout the United States, if the cleaner the gourd, the better the score is in the judging if you're into the competition. So, so sometimes your green clean gourds are the ones that you want. And other cases, such as this little canteen gourd right here, I chose it because it has, I call a modeled area that kind of looks like wood. In fact, I had a gourd that I sold that is now in uh, Japan, and it was a container with a lid and when I finished with it, when you stood back and looked at it, number one, you could not see where the lid came off, and number two, it looked like wood. It had so much texture in it from the mother nature, so it looked like wood. And so I was very proud of it, and it was very hard for me to get rid of it because I don't really enjoy selling. Let me see if I've missed anything very important here. Uh, of course, uh, the rattles, that was probably the first instrument that the gourd was used. You could take and, and shake it. Some gourds, the seeds end up in a ball inside, so they make no noise. And so you, you're getting ready to work on the gourd, depending on what you're going to do and how you're going to work on it. The first thing you want to do is to shake it. And if the seeds are loose, it's probably going to be fairly easy to clean out. If it doesn't rattle, those seeds have ended up into a hard ball on the inside. So when you cut it open, such as this gourd right here has been cut open, then this, with the opening here, and I'll get to this one here later, but they're very, you have to take like dental tools and so forth to clean until it takes hours to clean. Because once you open a gourd, you need to clean all the white membrane out especially if you're going to enter it in competition. And that, because if the judges find any white membrane, you probably will get disqualified, even if your gourd artwork is the best on the table, because you didn't follow the rules. And the gourd rules have gotten stricter and stricter over the years. I myself got involved, yes ma'am. Oh yes, a birdhouse, gourd birdhouses will last for years if you have treated them properly, yes. Yes, well, the most popular is a purple martin and they're normally uh, sprayed white. You know, that helps, they say that helps attract and so forth and I've, I've seen them last for years. I've got a little wren house that's about two years old uh, because my wooden wren house gave out on me and that's the only birdhouse that I've ever made out of a gourd. So a lot of people, you know, when you talk about gourds, it's either a dip or a drink or you're making birdhouses. I've never made but one birdhouse, and that was for myself or for the wrens, I should say. I beg your pardon? I couldn't tell you. I just picked out a, a gourd and, and uh, put a lip on the top of it. I think it was a cannonball, if I remember right. But that... Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at it when I got home. It's been years ago. But, yes? Okay, I know where that is. Purple Martins. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you, uh, my first experience with the gourd was on the farm because my grandfather would get a dipper gourd every year, cut the top out of the ball, and clean the inside, 
and yes, the water would be, it would be bitter. But you were drinking water from a well or a cistern that had a lot of iron, depending on where you lived, so it didn't make much difference. You didn't know any difference. If you had a glass of city water and you took a dipper gourd in, you probably would. Uh, as near to my knowledge, my grandfather did not treat the inside of it. But you can treat the inside of a gourd and make it food safe. And one of the best things to put on the inside of a gourd to make it food safe is beeswax. You can buy beeswax, you take a rag and you rub and rub the inside of it. It seals it. Let it set for a month and do it again. And you can put just about anything in that that you want to. Now you don't want water to sit in there for, you know, days and days and days. Some people will take gourds and use them as planters for flowers they're probably gonna get one season out of it because the inside of a gourd is extremely soft and it absorbs water. The exterior of the gourd repels water. I don't know how long it would take for a gourd to float before it would get water inside and sink because a gourd that weighs 100 pounds in the field, and I've, I saw one in Ohio several years ago that weighed 138 pounds. It was green. And when that gourd dries, it would weigh a little over 10 pounds, 13 pounds, something like that. So I always use 100-pound gourds will end up weighing about 10 pounds, maybe 12, depending on the thickness of the gourd. How thick is it? Oh, I don't know because I bought it dried, so I don't have I don't have any idea. I got there are five gourds I think in there totally, so they're all. It this gourd is is right now is pretty heavy, because there are several gourds and all the gourds are fairly thick, so I I couldn't I couldn't even guess. Uh, I'd have you'd have to weigh it um, when it was green, uh, in order to know how much it weighed in the field. The one I'm talking about that weighed 138 pounds it took a forklift to get it. From the, to the truck to get it to the uh, to the show. You have any more questions? The gourds. There's three basic groups. There's the ornamental, and that's the small gourds, the ones that some of those have to be hand pollinated, and then you have the hard shelled gourd, and that's as you see here on the table. Every one of these gourds are hard shelled gourd. And then the loofah, or loofahs. Anybody know what that is? Like a sponge. Uh, the Native Americans used it to scrub their bodies and probably scratch the heck out of them because it's, uh, <laughs> it's not very soft. It might be when it gets wet. And it's called a sponge gourd because it gets its name from that. Let me take a second here. So the, the people that are in the business of growing gourds to sell, if they have clean gourds, they can get more money for clean than you can dirty. There's two ways to, to clean a gourd that I know of. If anybody knows a better way, I want to hear it. I buy almost all my gourds clean now because of the amount of time it takes if a gourd has gone through the season, which is like any other, you know, start in the spring and goes into the fall, into the winter, and turns brown, then I soak those gourds for about 24 hours in water, bleach, and soap, and then I take a tire brush or a um, plastic, like an emery cloth, not emery cloth, what do I want to say, Pat, help me. Uh, to, to scrub them, anything to scrub the membrane on the outside because every gourd has a membrane on the outside that you have to get off before you can do your artwork on it or any kind of artwork on it. And if you see a white spot on the gourd, that is a membrane that you left on. So all you have to do is dampen that area, take an X-Acto knife, 
always keep the gourd wet when you're cleaning it if it's dried gourd never try to clean it with it dried because it'll scratch whatever you use like a scouring pad type it will scratch it but if it's wet it will not scratch it there are sanders out that you can sand gourds and uh, craftsmen used to make one and i think another company has taken it over and uh, it it does real well and it, for sanding the gourds and what it does it smooths the gourd and gives the gourd a sheen but uh, you never want to do anything uh, you know with anything coarse on a dried gourd because it will scratch and yes right yes but it would still be best in my opinion to take the outside membrane off but you didn't you wouldn't have to uh, some people joke they don't even paint them white they just cut the size a hole and you always have a drain hole in the bottom some people don't know that that helps keep it from rotting so if it does get wet inside the water has a place for it to drain out so you always you know, have a drain hole in your uh, purple martin houses your other way is to green clean a, a green cleaning gourds you're taking a gamble on the gourd shriveling on you like pumpkins and squash and so forth but i had a tremendous experience last year <laughs> i have a, a dust catcher because i do a lot of carving as you can see this here and i can take this and pass it around here in a little bit so you can look at it i have a dust catcher and i wear a mask and i wear headphones because my dust catcher is inside my house I take my dust catcher, fortunately I have an empty lot next door to me and if they never build a house on it, I'll, I'll be in good shape. So I emptied my dust catcher out and uh, uh, last fall, Pat, my wife, this is my bride right over here, uh, 53 years in fact, very proud of that. She came in and she says, we've got something growing in the lot next door. There's a bunch of white spots out there, and um, Pat doesn't drink, so I knew she was, you know, wasn't seeing things. So I went out, and lo and behold, on the side of this rocky hill, and where I live in the Lake of the Ozarks, it's almost all rock, and the vine was huge. And so I thought, what I want to do is I want to green clean these, so I left them alone. And I took a gallon bucket out. Pat was in town. I took a gallon bucket out. When the, the stems started turning brown, some of them were already broken off. Some of them I just touched, they fell off. Some of them I had to snap off. I filled that gallon bucket and had to go get another bucket. And I had 82 of the most beautiful egg gourds you ever saw in your life free of charge, Mother Nature. And so I took my pocket knife that I use all the time with the gourds and I scraped all the membrane off and I never lost one. I found one that was already shriveled, which is, it's very fortunate. The advantage to that, those gourds are all a real light tan. I mean, almost white. And that's how we spotted them. So there, there is an advantage to green cleaning, but you can't, you do, you take a chance on getting, um, getting in trouble with them shrinking. And I wish I could remember, and I need for my wife to get on the computer for me because I don't touch the computer and I don't have a cell phone. That tells you how old and, and uh, bullheaded I am. Uh, I forgot where I'm going or where I was. Uh, forgot what I wanted to talk about. Uh, now I'm showing my age. Good. Get me started. The, the, the best way is to go through the full season off of the ground. If the, That'll make it the cleanest. Yes. Yeah. And there, yes, go ahead. Rather than growing them on a trellis, can you put straw under them and accomplish the same thing? 
Some people have done that, yes. And uh, you may get a little spot. Uh, no, I don't have it with me. It's on the table over there. I have one over there, that a bottle, big bottle gourd. No, is it this one? No. Anyway, but no, it's, um, I've heard of people doing that. I don't know how well it works. There's all kinds of tricks. Like you take a dipper gourd, and then I've seen dipper gourds that are in competition that are taller than I am. And uh, some of those growers will take a nylon hose and put rocks or bricks in it. And as it grows, it stretches that neck and makes it taller. Some people take a rope and they put a rope around and that makes that dipper gourd grow in a spiral. So there, and some people take and they tie knots in dipper gourds. And that's a long drawn out process. From my understanding, you get about one out of 10 with a knot tied in it. I've seen as many as two knots tied. And the, the, uh, the most fantastic gourds that I've ever seen was either China or Japan. And the American Gordon magazine had an article and the gourd work there was phenomenal. I mean, it, it, uh, it was beautiful. And now I would like to get in a little bit here. I've still got some good time left. I got involved in this in about 1999. Uh, my wife and a real good friend came home and they had two gourds. They had been to a craft festival in Arkansas and Patsy, our friend, she collects Santa Clauses. So they wanted Santa Clauses painted on these two gourds. Well, the last gourd I'd ever seen in my life was a dipper gourd on the farm when I was about 10 or 12 years old. So I ended up painting on these two gourds, which I do not like to paint. I do not have any formal education in painting. I did work as a graphic artist for one of the largest screen printing companies in the world up in the Kansas City metropolitan area. And that was a Cinderella story, no matter what our government tries to tell you. Uh, when I started there in 1960 with 20 employees, when I left, there were 500, 37 years later. And uh, we never took a government contract. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> uh, so I hope, hope I haven't lost some of you people. <laughs> but anyway, it, this, I thought, was really interesting because artists normally are painting on a flat surface. And when you pick up a gourd, the challenging part, especially if you're drawing an animal or a person or a bird or something, that gourd is very unforgiving. Like a cannonball gourd may look like it's perfect, but when you start laying that out to do work on it, you will find out there's one little bulge over here that's not over here. So when you're measuring that, because I, I will divide certain of my drawings, such as this one right here, I will divide them up in vertical and horizontal panels so they can end up square or rectangle or whatever. The closer together that I make them, the finer the cutting gets. The farther apart, the thicker the cutting gets. So this was separated here about 3 eighths of an inch apart in order to get that gap. So it, it's, uh, now I'm losing my thought again. <laughs> I need some more help. But anyway, to, uh, I knew that I was gonna get involved in something. So the next year I went to the craft festival with Patsy and, and all four of us went, her husband Dean, and I bought 12 gourds. And I bought a, I call it a Bo Boy Scout wood burning set. That was a mistake because <laughs> I did not know anything about artwork on gourds. And I went through those 12 gourds in no time at all with doing all kinds of drawings. I don't even remember what they look like. I have a photo magazine or a album with pictures and so forth that I'd be ashamed to show you from then to today. So I got a hold of a friend of mine because I ran out of gourds and he had a computer and he lived at the Lake of the Ozarks. To make a long story short, I went down and I bought 82 gourds from this orchard uh, west of Springfield, Missouri. 
And so I had Pat's little Honda full <laughs> of these gourds because they were from this size to this size and so forth. And I had 82 of them. And now if I don't have 300 or more gourds to work on, I, I'm panicky. And I'm kind of panicky right now because I've got a project in my head and I don't have the gourds I need to work on. So I'm going to have to take a trip, evidently. But you get bit, I think, artists get bit by gourd art because of the shape that they're working with, just dividing this up equally all the way around takes longer than it does to cut it out. It takes hours to lay it out, and it could take just a few minutes or just an hour to, to cut every one of these out at the top. Not the whole thing, but just the top. So it, it's, my wife always says, how do you have the patience to sit there and do that? And gourd art is about the only thing that I have a lot of patience with. Now she's nodding her head, yes, I can tell without even looking over there. So, and I don't know why, and I've worked uh, on trying to have more patience with other things, but I do not do the artwork on the gourds to sell because I do not like to sell. I'd rather give gourds away than I would sell. Yes, sir. So as a farmer, I would love to sell. <laughs> so, so as, as an artist buying gourds, do you know, get started growing gourds, yep. where, where would be the best place to start and what type of gourd to sell to the art community? Any kind of gourd. Any kind of gourd in the art community. And one of the best places to sell them would be at the Show Me Gourd Society Gourd Show the last full weekend of April. And Show Me Gourd Society. It's, it's on the front of the, if you've got one of those papers, and um, if you'll stop by my booth, I will be here for, short, for a short period of time after this. I have some cards I can give you, giving the details and so forth. And the, because we just moved down to the Springfield area uh, last year. So uh, 2013 will be our second year. And, and it's a great place to sell. Yes. I'm not a grower. If I would, I'd hate, I would hate to answer that. Uh, I've heard two different stories about gourd seeds. I've heard that if a gourd freezes, the seed's no good. I've heard that's not true. So I don't know. You would have to talk to gourd grower. Uh, go ahead. Would you rather buy them clean? Clean. <laughs> that's real simple. And because yes ma'am what prices do you pay for these what i've paid as much as fifty dollars for one gourd clean and as a big gourd so what's the difference i'm sorry go ahead what's the difference in say if you bought that gourd not clean or clean that same gourd that was fifty dollars clean what would it have been not clean it would have probably been at least half that or maybe less and then when you got it home and you cleaned it it not might not be worth two cents. So when I first got involved in it, I had no idea of what I was buying, why I wanted to buy it. I just liked the shape and this, that, and the other, and so forth. But you learn over time of you pick up a gourd, and if that gourd has some heft to it, if it's heavy or feels heavy, there's two things. Either it's not cured, not, it's wet inside and you can't see it, which is probably not the case if it's gone through the full season. Like the gourd, this summer around this area may not have been a great year because of the, of the drought on gourds, so I'm anxious to see what we get next year. Because we'll be buying this year's gourd next year at the Missouri Gourd Show. And maybe some that are three or four years old that hadn't been sold, they just keep bringing back. So depending on 
what you want to make with the gourd, if you don't want to open it up, you really don't care how thick it is. It doesn't make much difference to you. Those egg gourds that I have, that I have cut a couple of them apart, and I've gotten away without breaking them so far. But I may not get that lucky, you know. And if I break it, I keep all my pieces. I got five-gallon buckets. Everything that's cut out here is in my five-gallon bucket somewhere, or I made that flower. If you can see that flower inside there, that flower is all gourd and gourd seeds. Gourd seeds for the center of it and gourd pieces. And that gourd was an accident, and some of them are accidents. I was cutting that gourd so I could cut that all the way around, just like you see those little cutouts. It slipped out of my hands, and two of those pieces and there broke. And sometimes they can break, and you can glue them back together, and you can't find the break. I knew that was not going to work on this. And then Pat, she came down and said, well, that would really be neat if you made something and put inside there. So what I did is cut out the same amount of number on each side, and then I wood burnt the back of it. And then I started picking pieces up, and I made the petals and the leaves and so forth, and, and made the flower. So that gourd would have to go in a sculptured category. A sculptured is where you take pieces to make something. Like I've made a giraffe for my wife. She likes, she has a collection of giraffes. I think we've got a hundred or more in the house. And uh, so, I, you know, you made different animals. I've made oriental doll for her. So there's, there's a lot of sculpturing. We have um, a very, very fortunate in the state of Missouri. We probably have six artists or more that are nationally known artists. And I am, am fortunate enough to be one of them. And on my little business card there in front, I want to brag a little bit, and that's very, it's very hard for me to do. But that gourd there on that business card, I entered in what they called a juried show. That's where you fill out an application, and it was in Kerrville, Texas. It's a national show. They take about 25 artists out of everybody that applies, and you don't get your money back if you don't get chosen. And then you have to deliver your gourds, and they have about four different categories that you can enter in, or you can enter in one category. And that year, I entered, I think, four gourds. That gourd on my business card got a blue ribbon and got best of show. That gourd came apart. The outside gourd came apart in three pieces. I still have the gourd at home. I did not bring it today. I chose this gourd over it. And so I was very proud of that gourd, and I still have it. I have somebody in mind to give that to. And, you know, I've got prices. If you, if you look, I've got prices on my gourds. My gourds run from $20 up to several hundred dollars or into the thousands. Depends on, you know, what it is. My wife has one gourd that I carved three bonsai trees out of. It's a bowl type. And... That's her gourd. So she put the price on it. And I told her one of these days somebody's going to pay it and you're not going to have it. <laughs> and I do not like to duplicate artwork. Uh, I will if I have to, but it, it has to be a very special occasion. But the, uh, I want to get into the show just a little bit, if I may, and promote. Uh, We've got time and I don't want to run over. <clears throat> But please feel free to interrupt me and ask me any questions. We have, I think, around 77 different categories in our show, in the Show Me Gourd Society. Maybe it's more than that now. We have a, a growing category. So you have dried gourds category where you would have the smallest, the largest, the longest, the most unusual that grew in around a fence, or three grew together, uh, so forth. So you have categories for growers. And then we start with the children, because we're trying to get young people interested in gourd art. And I'm in hopes, and I have a good opportunity in Springfield, 
to spend one full day in an art class with every art class this teacher has and I'm just waiting for that phone call because I'm dying to do that because it's, uh, it, it, it'll be a lot of fun because I haven't been to school for years. <laughs> so that will be a lot of fun. But then, and that runs up to I think 17 years old and then you get into the novice category. The novice category is a category where you're just beginning. You have never ever entered a show you've never won a ribbon first second or third place and then we have the open category and that's where you have won one or more two or three whatever it is I don't know remember all the rules of blue ribbons so now you're in the open category and after you start doing that for a while and you won best to show and you did this then we have a master's category and it just gets tougher and tougher and tougher, believe me. And the master's category, I think, has about four categories. So in the Missouri show, I could only enter four gourds. And there's normally a category that I stay clear out of. I do not do any weaving or anything like that, and I've never tried it. But if I did try weaving, I would not have to enter the master's because I've never done that before. So. That's, that's kind of the way that the show has run. And then uh, there's all kinds of different awards in the towns. We usually have the mayor come out and have the mayor pick out his favorite gourd that's in the competition. And that's just kind of a, a publicity stunt that we try to get you know, more people involved. But uh, to, see the, to see the children get involved in it, I think is one of the, the most exciting part, for me anyway. Any more questions that you have? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I wouldn't pick it green and let it dry without scraping the membrane off. And I would not pick it green until the stem turns brown. Now that's what I've been told by growers, so that, but because I'm not a grower and I don't have a really a lot of background in that other than the questions that I've asked. So to answer your question, you're, I think you're better off if you're going to sell them, to grow them to sell, I think you're better off letting them go through. You might want to pick out so many if, if you have a good crop of a certain kind and because it takes it takes quite a bit of time to scrape that green membrane off, and then you have to lay them out so they're not touching each other, to let them comp to dry. I laid these out in my basement on a rug in my workshop, and like I said, none of them shrunk, so I I got real lucky in that area there. But I know they can shrink. One thing that did enter my mind, and I'm not trying to be a politician or anything and I wish I could remember where I found this because I want my wife to try to find it I won't because I want to print it out and, and share it with everybody years ago and I think it was in the 1800s uh, there was a controversy and some some states still have a controversy on whether it's a fruit or a vegetable and I cannot remember so I can't answer that question but I can tell you this, when in the 18, whatever it was, the dates were, they were trying to determine whether it was fruit or vegetable. And our government got involved. And our government had a tax tariff on one. Guess what the government called it? And I don't remember whether it was vegetable or fruit, but I thought I'd just share that with you. I thought it was kind of interesting at the time, and I just I let it go, and, and I, didn't, uh, I didn't keep that thought. I'm going to glance through here real quick, if you'll bear with me, and see if there's something that uh, I left out. Yet there are countries that uh, uh, gourds have played uh, a part in their religion and their beliefs in different countries. I thought that was rather interesting. In 
In Haiti, in 1807, the gourd became valued for more than a functional use. At this time, the country was bankrupt, and its people were entirely dependent on gourds as utensils and food sources. In order to get people to grow coffee beans instead, the government collected all of the gourds on the island as property of the state. They collected well over 200,000. When the coffee beans harvest was ready, he exchanged gourds for coffee, which then sold to the Europeans for gold. So it kind of tells you that gourd has really played a, a, a huge part in our world uh, as, as we know it today and, and still does. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't, I'm just about to run out of gas and just about to run out of ideas unless you have any more questions. Uh, I thought I could talk for an hour and a half, but uh, maybe I can't. Yes, there are, that's a good point. I think there's about 28 states now that have gourd societies. Hawaii does. I think Michigan was the last state that got uh, their chapter uh, recognized. I've not been to Michigan uh, to them. I've, Pat and I have traveled from, uh, yes? I once saw a TV show about a company that was making uh, toys and all kinds of sellable products out of the gourds instead of decorating them. And is that part of your uh, categories? And, uh, and do you know anything about that part of the gourd industry or the gourd world? World. Okay, now back, get that to me again here. There was a company using gourds to make all kinds of toys and craft items. I think they made helmets out of them and masks and different kinds of sellable items. They had a company. We have categories that, uh, like wall hangings or mask categories. I have seen a lot of hats. Uh, you remember the uh, old baseball hats? that used to have the propeller on top of them. I made one of those. Uh, I know a man named Rob Gayo, who Rob was uh, raised emus, and he carved on emu eggs and inlaid the emu carving in the, the gourd and had beautiful artwork in it. And he made a pith helmet out of a gourd that was just phenomenal. I mean, in pieces. That was a sculptured gourd because it was in two pieces. So, no, I, I don't know about a company doing that, but it's very interesting because to, to, I'd be interested to know where they're, if they're growing their own or if they're buying them or what they're doing because the gourds are very strong. I mean, they're stronger than, than you realize. And if you drop them on a concrete floor, you know, it's probably going to crack. And you, if it's a cannonball gourd and it's fairly thick, it may bounce just like a ball and not, not crack at all. Uh, but it, any time that, you know, any time that I don't like a gourd, I put it on the floor and I throw it in my five-gallon bucket. Nobody sees it. And if I don't like it, then I don't want anybody to see it. People think that's kind of silly. But to get back to myself, and then I'm, I always like to close with this because I shied away from artwork my entire life, and something or somebody kept coming back and coming back and coming back and pounding me on the head that uh, you should get involved in art, and I kept ignoring it. I was an athlete. I wanted to go to school and play football and run track, and I did, and I had art as a minor. I have very little formal art degree or education. I have no degree from college. I met this beautiful lady over here my junior year and about four months later it was all over and got married and we went to work. And then I went to work for Gill Studios, the company. But I've looked and I said a while ago I, I would rather give a gourd away than to sell a gourd because I finally come to my senses and by sheer luck I got that job at Gill Studios where an old sign painter taught me the trade of how to lay out and do this, that, and the other. And I had a God's gift in this hand, left-handed. And that's how I made my living. 
and I was on the drawing board for about seven or eight years. So whenever I give a gourd away, it's my way of thanking the good Lord for the talent that he gave me and to make my living at that because I can remember the day that I went into this company thinking they're going to pay me to draw. I couldn't believe it. And they're going to give me a dollar and a half an hour. And that was in 1960. I thank all of you and God bless.